Well, good morning, Mount Pleasant. It's good to be here with you. Thank you for tuning in uh, this morning. I'm recording uh, tonight uh, about 9 o'clock, so I'm hoping uh, at this point when you're watching that there's a lot of snow on the ground, uh, and maybe afterwards you can get outside and, and play around and enjoy it with your family. Um, but right now, um, let's uh, let's go ahead and get, in, and get into it, jump right in uh, to Matthew chapter number 7, verses 1 through 6. We're getting right. Um, getting right along with uh, the Sermon on the Mount. We're just going to continue on. Uh, we're not going to stop because of the, the little bit of delay we got now with the, with the snow. So Matthew 7, verses 1 through 6. So if you'll turn with me there, we're going to be looking over these next couple of weeks at, um, at kingdom relationships. Uh, what does it mean uh, to, to, to be a part of the kingdom and how then being a part of the kingdom, how does that transform our uh, relationships? And we'll look at the different ones that, that come along with that, that Jesus discusses here in Matthew chapter 7. So uh, this will be sort of part one um, this Sunday. And we're going to look at the relationship that we are to have uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and then interestingly enough, um, our relationship to pigs and dogs. Now that sounds uh, quite unusual, I know. Uh, but we'll get into that uh, here in just a, uh, a few moments. It's not literal pigs and dogs, uh, as you might have uh, uh, figured out you know, by now as you look at the text. But we'll get there in just a few moments. So Matthew 7, verses 1 through 6, it reads like this. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet or use, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote or the speck that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote or the speck out of thine own eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Verse number 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, Neither cast ye your pearls before swine or pigs, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you or attack you. So as we've gone throughout the sermon, uh, if, we, if you've learned nothing else, uh, I hope it's, it's stuck with us uh, that the kingdom of God, that his rule and reign uh, is sort of breaking into this world and into our lives. Uh, I hope we, if nothing else, we come to the fact um, that this very thing changes us, that the kingdom of God uh, coming into the world is, has come to change us. As kingdom people, we are to be distinct um, in our character, in our witness, our, our obedience, our righteousness, our religious practices, our ambitions. Uh, and now, as we're going to see again over the next few weeks, the kingdom of God changes our relationships. And we'll see this in terms of our relationship with our fellow brother, uh, and now with dogs and pigs, whatever that means. And um, we'll find out so, hopefully here in a few moments. Um, we're going to look at our relationship that we're to have with God, or with humanity as a whole, uh, with false teachers, and finally uh, with Jesus. Now, this only makes sense, right, that uh, the kingdom changes us, right? The kingdom changes us internally. It changes our heart. And naturally, out of that uh, is going to flow a change in the way in which we relate uh, with other people, the attitude that we show towards others. So in the, in the first six verses here, Matthew 7, uh, Jesus reveals uh, to us the type of attitude uh, in which we are to have towards our brother and sister in Christ, uh, and then to a group of, of people designated here by Jesus himself as dogs and pigs. Now at the outset, uh, certainly, this is this is startling words for us to hear from uh, the lips of Jesus, but but we'll we'll get to that shortly, uh, and, we'll, and we'll seek to understand what what he means by this. Um, and and it it appears that at the outset that that these things are, are two polar opposites, right? Uh, the dogs and the pigs and the brothers and sisters in Christ, and and they are, uh, but this is actually what makes sense, or what makes these. Uh, two relationships go together. Again, well, that'll become clear more uh, in, in just a few moments. In short, as we relate to our brothers and sisters, uh, we are to, as we're going to see, have an attitude of generosity 
uh, in service instead of judgment and hypocrisy. And to the dogs and the pigs, interestingly enough, Jesus is going to say we are to have no relationship at all. Uh, it's important to note that in, in both of these cases, um, it appears that some kind of wrong has been done. Uh, in the first, the brother or sister uh, is at fault, and Jesus shows um, what our proper response should be to them in that. And then secondly, the dogs and the pigs are also at fault, but in a much different uh, different way. And Jesus is going to reveal again the proper relation uh, or response that we are to have to them. So as we progress through, uh, the simple point of all these relationships is, is to reveal to us the, the proper attitude that we are to have uh, towards each, towards each of these relationships, an attitude that has been transformed by the kingdom of God as it comes to bear uh, in our lives. So first, we see here in verses 1 through 5, uh, the kingdom attitude uh, towards our brothers, towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. And remember at the outset, the context of this relationship and the subsequent attitude, uh, this this interaction that we're having here in verses one through five, it's it's coming out. It's arising out of some kind of fault uh, in our brother or sister. Something has has happened personally, communally, uh, wherever whatever it may be. But either way, there's a problem. And with that in mind, ha- how are we going to then relate to our brother or sister in that specific situation? Well, Jesus is going to provide us with two attitudes in which we are not to have in this situation where wrong has been done followed by the correct way. So in verses 1 through 2, we are not to be their judge. In verses two through four, or 3 through 4, we are not to be a hypocrite. And finally, in verse 5, we are to be a brother. So first, here in verses 1 through 2, we are not to be a judge. He says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you use, it shall be measured to you again. Now, we all have all kinds of misconceptions when it comes to this verse because this is perhaps one of the most misquoted, uh, misinterpreted, misused passages in, in all of Scripture. And we've all heard it abused, haven't we? You know, someone is, is clearly uh, in, in the wrong, objectively in the wrong. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's cheating on an exam or cheating on a spouse. Maybe it's gossiping about someone, maybe it's cutting corners at work, really the list could go on, but something objectively wrong has been done, and what do you hear in response? You may you may point that out, you may say, you know, hey man, that's that's not right, right? You you shouldn't you shouldn't be doing that. It's objectively wrong. But what's the response that oftentimes you get? Well, don't judge me, right? Don't judge me. Only God can judge me. Right? Judge not, you know. Uh, and, and in a way, then, we begin to think that what Jesus is prohibiting here is, is any kind of critical evaluation. Uh, this, this idea that we can never point out wrongs, we can never label sin, uh, and, and, and we begin to just simply turn a blind eye to everything that is wrong, and letting people, uh, and, and even ourselves, go unchecked in, in anything and everything that we do. But this really doesn't make any sense that this is what Jesus would be saying, right? We, we all know that there are things that are uh, that every sane human being would deem something we ought not do. I don't know many people that would say it's okay to, to just murder someone in cold blood, right? No, not many people would say that that's okay. So it doesn't make sense practically to say Jesus meant here that you should never use your critical faculties to judge or examine or point out what is right or wrong. Certainly that is not the case. But even more so in a biblical sense, Jesus turns right around and he's going to deem certain individuals as dogs and pigs. Later on in the passage, he's going to tell us uh, to, to judge false prophets based upon their fruit. In Matthew 18, what do we read? If a brother sins against us, we are to point out to him personally his fault. Even in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul tells Timothy that scriptures, the scriptures that are God-breathed, are what? Are profitable in part for what? For rebuking. So it's clear then that when Jesus says, judge not, he is not telling us to never make value judgments. He's, never t- he's not telling us to never, never point out wrongs, never, never point out sin. 
It's, it, it would make it would not make any sense based upon Jesus' teachings, based upon the rest of Scripture, for Jesus to say that, right? All of the Sermon on the Mount is teaching us to evaluate, right? To evaluate our lifestyle and, and what Christ has is, is done through his his inbreaking kingdom into our lives. For example, we are to, he says, evaluate and develop a righteousness that is far superior to the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. So how in the world, you know, could we know what righteousness we are to possess if we didn't first critically evaluate the fruit or the the, the fault of the righteousness of the, the Pharisees? So again, Jesus is not telling us to never evaluate. Rather, he is telling us that we are not to be overly critical in a condemning fashion. Right? What he is forbidding here, according to John Stott, is not assessing people critically, but judging them harshly. And he continues on by saying that this type of critic is a fault finder who is negative and destructive towards other people and enjoys actively seeking out their failings. We all know this, this type of person, right? This is certainly different than the type of, uh, of judgment, the type of value uh, uh, evaluation that we are to give, right? It's not saying that we are to never make these value judgments. It's rather, it's this idea of actively seeking out, enjoying pointing out other people's flaws, right? And judging them, them harshly, not with an eye towards reconciliation, not with an eye towards helping them out, but with an eye of putting them down further and further and further while propping ourselves up, right, and making ourselves look better. And, and this is what Jesus is condemning. As verse 2 goes on to clarify, it's the type of judgment that sees ourselves individually as occupying the bench, right, that the true judge of this world occupies. Right? It's the type of judging that, that puts ourselves in the place of God as if, we are, we are over men and women with the right to you know strike the gavel and onto that sounding block. But we don't have that right. Listen to Paul's words. He writes this to the Romans. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. So yes, certainly God is the one that judges us, right? But, but Jesus is not condemning uh, uh, us making value judgments. He's condemning us, uh, those that seek to put their play, their their um, their selves in that place that only God um, occupies. So that's the point that Paul is making here. Um, it's the point that Jesus is making. It's not that we are to never rebuke, never correct, never to point out sin, but that in so doing, we never seek to do so from a place of ultimate authority. We never seek to do so from a place. Uh, that only God occupies. We can evaluate actions, right? But never motives. God judges the heart, something that we can't possibly do. Instead of putting ourselves in, in the place of God and judging others with this critical, harsh, condemning fashion that is just simply not our place to do, we must be aware that we ourselves are among the judged, and we shall be judged with the strictness in which we judge others. Stott says this, If we pose as judges, we cannot plead ignorance of the law we claim to be able to administer. If we enjoy, listen to this, if we enjoy occupying the bench, we must not be surprised to find ourselves in the dock. Paul says it like this, You have no excuse, O man, whoever you are, when you judge another, for in passing judgment upon him you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the very same thing things. You know, wouldn't it be frustrating uh, to go to court for a speeding violation, right? You get fined by the judge, and you're on your way out, you're, you're, you're dejected, you just spent a lot of money, you're going to your car, the judge has, has maybe went out on ahead of you, you get in your car and, and the judge pulls out first and he goes, he rolls up to the stop sign, he doesn't stop, and he just keeps on going, right? We have to understand that we ought not judge harshly, for we ourselves often do the very same things. 
And in so doing, we incur harsher judgment by the true and perfect judge. We, we are so guilty of this, right? We're so guilty of, uh, of putting down and judging others in such a way where we place ourselves as the highest authority. Again, it's not that we don't point out sin. It's not that we don't point out faults in our brothers and sisters. Certainly we're to do so, and Paul is gonna, or Jesus is going to tell us how to do it in just a moment. But we're so guilty of this attitude of putting others down in order to prop ourselves up. Right? We have to be very, very careful to not judge others and then turn around and do the very same thing or perhaps even worse. Stott sums it up like this. He says, The command to judge not is not a requirement to be blind, but rather a plea to be generous. Jesus does not tell us to cease to be men by suspending our ability to evaluate, but to renounce the presumptuous ambition to be God by setting ourselves up as judges. So one, we are not to put ourselves in the place of God and judge others. Secondly, we are not to be hypocrites. Jesus says, why do you, you know, and why behold thou the mote or the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you consider not the log or the beam that is in your own eye? Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull out that speck from your eye and behold, there's a beam, there's a log coming out of your own eye. And this little parable here that Jesus tells us it connects us to what has just went before. And it shows us another reason why we are, we are unfit. We are unfit to be judges over other individuals. Simply put, we are sinners, right? Just like the rest of our brothers and sisters. And if we fail to understand that, we become the hypocrite. The picture this parable paints is of two individuals in a wood shop, right? One, one man gets a speck of dirt, uh, maybe sawdust, uh, in his eye and he's seeking right to carefully remove it. It's almost like I'm, I, I do with my contacts. When something gets in it, I try to carefully remove it. And if anybody has contacts, you know what I'm talking about. It's so frustrating to get something in your eye and you have to very, very carefully remove it so you're not, you don't rip your contact. And so his, his vision, and, and my vision in that case, is, is hindered, right? It's hindered from that speck and he's, he's having difficulty removing it. Now, would I want someone... Would this man want someone to come and help him that has a, a log? Obviously, this is a humorous account. Uh, it's, it's exaggeration here. But would I want someone whose, whose vision is clearly more hindered than mine coming to help me get that out of my eye? Certainly not. Same is true for this case. Would this man who has a speck of sawdust in his eye want this man that has a log coming out of his own eye coming to help coming to help get that speck out. Again, it's a humorous picture, and Jesus is obviously exaggerating the scenario, but it's meant to emphasize this ridiculous notion that, that someone with a log coming out of their own eye should be able to come and remove a piece of sawdust from someone else's eye. So what is Jesus trying to say here? Well, let's answer this again by looking first at, at what he isn't saying. Uh, again, he is not saying that we should ignore the speck in our brother's eye, nor is he saying that we shouldn't help our brother. Rather, what Jesus is saying is that far too often we're hypocritical towards the faults of our brothers and sisters. We nitpick, right? We nitpick at the sins in their lives while we ignore the more serious faults in our own. Uh, Stott says it like this, we have a fatal tendency to exaggerate the faults of others and minimize the gravity of our own. Doesn't that sound like us, right? He continues on, he says, On the contrary, we have a rosy view of ourselves and a jaundiced view of others. Indeed, what we are, all, what we are often doing is seeing our own faults in, in others and judging them vicariously. That way, we experience the pleasure of self-righteousness without the pain of penitence. Let me read that one more time. What we are often doing is seeing our own faults in others and judging them vicariously. That way we experience the pleasure of self-righteousness without the pain of penitence. Do we see this? In other words, far too often we feel good about ourselves and, and will do so at any cost. Right? We, 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 we neglect the faults in ourselves, but if we can just find faults in other people, that's going to prop ourselves right up. This, according to A.B. Bruce, is a pharisaic 
uh, 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 activity. That of exalting ourselves by disparaging others. A very cheap way, he says, of attaining moral superiority. Think of the Pharisee uh, in the public and in Luke 18. Jesus uh, talking to those who, according to Luke, trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, tells us about this Pharisee whom, while in the temple, he looks over at this public and this this tax-collecting sinner, and he says this. This is the way he starts his prayer. He says, he says, Thank you, God, that I am not like that guy. Thank you that I am not like this public and sinner. You know all these things that he does, and, and look at the, all the great things that I do. What does Jesus say? Jesus says that the, the, the one that the, uh, the, the Pharisee didn't go home justified while the public and sinner who admitted his sin went home justified. You know, you see, oftentimes we, we fail to neglect uh, that we are all sinful, fallible humans. And, and this simple fact disqualifies us from being judges over others. Being judges over other sinners just like you and me. We must learn to be like G.K. Chesterton, who, when asked by the Times of London in the early 1900s, he, he was asked this enormous question, what's wrong with the world today? Now, we would all have all kinds of answers, right? I, I know what some of our answers would be. That person. That, this person over here. That political party, this political party, right? That group or this group. G.K. Chesterton replied to this question of what is wrong with the world today by this. He said, Dear Sir, I am <laughs> yours, G.K. Chesterton. What is wrong with the world? Chesterton replied, I am. You see, until we get a proper evaluation of ourselves, we're never in a position to evaluate others properly. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost, or the chief. Listen, until we grasp that last part, right, that we are the chief of sinners, until we grasp that last part, we will never fully understand the implications of that first part, that Christ has came in the world to save sinners. Terry Johnson says this. He says, A constant awareness of my past failure and continuing corruption is not only not contrary to a rich apprehension of grace, but its necessary companion. He says, Being reminded of my past failures and my continuing failures is a, is a, a, a perfect companion, a necessary companion to God's grace. He says, The exceeding greatness of of God's grace in Christ is understood in its fullness only against the black backdrop of my unworthiness. Listen, it is then and only then that we can we can burst forth through the praise that we see in verses 16 through 17. Paul says, I am the chief of sinners. And in verses that follow, he says this, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost... Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus' call is not for us to ignore the faults in others, not to ignore truth, not to, not to ignore the fact that there is things that are objectively right and things that are objectively wrong in this world. Nor is the call for us to not help when we see these things. We are to do these things, as we will see, but only once we've dealt with ourselves. Only once we've properly critiqued ourselves. And then Jesus says this in verse 5, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then shall you be able to see clearly how to get the speck out of your brother's eye. Look, once we deal with the sin in our own lives, then we will be able to serve our brother graciously in removing the speck from his eye. We're not to be a judge. We're not to be a hypocrite. 
Rather, we are to be a brother, right? A brother has a sense of responsibility to his sibling. I have a brother, right? I, I know my brother feels that sense of responsibility towards me. I feel that sense of responsibility towards him in that we have to help each other out, right? It, it's not loving for a brother to let the speck remain in his brother's eye or sister's eye. But it's also not helpful for your brother to try to remove it blindly. Again, as Stott says, it is evident that Jesus is not condemning criticism as such, but rather the criticism of others when we exercise no comparable self-criticism nor correction as such, but rather the correction of others when we have not, uh, have not first corrected ourselves. This is how brotherly criticism works, right? We critique not out of this desire to prop ourselves up, not out of this desire to say, oh, look at, look at what he's into. That's certainly, that's so, that's so much worse than what I'm into. Look at, uh, you know, I'm up here. This dude's down here, right? This is not the way we critique. This is not the purpose of critiquing. The purpose of critiquing a brother or sister is not that we may build ourselves up, right? The way we're to critique is, is to do it out of great care, to do it out of, out of deep humility. John Chrysostom says it like this, Correct him, but not as a foe, nor as an adversary exacting a penalty, but as a physician providing medicines. Right? As a physician providing medicine. This is how a brother critiques a brother. Knowing that as soon as tomorrow, I may need my brother's help as well. This is a good way to live. This is a good way to serve. It's a good way to, to, to display the kingdom of God in this world. What a way to relate to a brother and sister. This is discipleship in practice, right? This is how it should work. But this will obviously not always be the case, right? Uh, some will embrace criticism and, and move on, right? Some will embrace the kingdom of God and the change that it affects in your heart, but others won't. In fact, what we're going to see next is that some will be completely hostile towards the kingdom of God. His role, his reign, that breaking into their lives and changing them. And this is the case to those that he calls dogs and pigs. We see this in verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again, and rend you. So we see the attitude that we are to have towards our brother, right? We're not to be a judge. We're not to be a hypocrite. We're to be a brother, right? We're to be a, a, a brother, one that seeks to have uh, responsibility, one that one one that that sees out of a, a deep humility and, and grace how to properly take that speck out of our brother's eye, right? So that we both may be able to go forward together. But he turns from that attitude that we're to have to our brother towards the attitude that we're to have to those designated as dogs and pigs. Now, again, this is startling language from Jesus here. But it won't be uncommon for him to say things like this, to use this type of language at other points in his ministry. We know that he, he's going to call the Pharisees at times. He's going to say that they are whitewashed tombs, that they are a brood of vipers. And this drastic descriptive language in both cases is used as a way to emphasize the character of those designated as such. It's like saying this, that you know, you know the quote, uh, if it walks like a duck, if it talks like a duck, if it has feathers like a duck, right? What is it? It's probably a duck, right? Same is true here. Jesus is, is calling, by calling these individuals dogs and pigs, is simply revealing what they are, their true character. Stott says it like this, By giving them these names, Jesus is indicating not only that they are more animal than human, but that they are animals with dirty habits, as well. Think about it, dogs. Think about these dogs. It's, it's not the kind of dog that we have in mind. It's not the kind of dog that I that I have and many of you have, right? That 
that we take to the we take to the vet, we take to the groomers that sleeps in our bed. This is not the type of dog that that Jesus has in mind. Rather, the dogs in that in that time were these wild scavengers, right? That that fed on the city's trash dumps. Not a very good picture. And then we have this image of a pig, which is an unclean animal for the Jews. Uh, not just an unclean animal for the Jews, but but one who loved mud, right? And to to wallow or wallow around in that. Uh, Peter said this about it. He says the dog turns back to his own vomit, and the pig is washed only to wallow in the mire. It's a pretty pretty graphic description of these two individuals, right? But who are they? Who are these pigs? These dogs? In a very general sense, it, it speaks to unbelievers, but it, it can't possibly speak to all unbelievers, right? For for Jesus says, we, we are not to give them what is holy. Uh, we are not to cast out to them what are pearls. So so more specifically, who are these? Who who are these these unbelievers? Well, to answer this, we need to first understand that that which is holy. Uh, we are to understand what that that pearl is. In Matthew uh, thirteen forty six, Jesus tells us a parable concerning uh, the pearl of great price, which in that context referred to the kingdom of God and salvation, uh, i.e. the gospel. Um, given the prominent theme then of the kingdom of God in the Sermon on the Mount, right, and our responsibility to live it out, to be a witness uh, to others for it, it appears that Jesus is saying the very same thing here. In short, what he's saying is don't preach the gospel to the dogs and the pigs. Don't proclaim the kingdom of God to them any longer. The image is quite clear. The Jew, right, the Jews would never give holy food or perhaps food, you know, sacrificed um, uh, as, a, as an offering, for example. It says the Jews would never give this holy food to, to an unclean dog, nor would they ever throw, throw pearls to pigs who, who realizing that they couldn't eat these pearls would simply trample them under under their feet or or possibly even attack the one that gave them to them. So it's clear from this picture that Jesus had in mind not not a the broad category of those that don't don't believe. Uh, rather, as Stott says, they must refer uh, they must refer to those who have had ample opportunity to hear and receive the good news, but have decisively, even defiantly, rejected it. Calvin says that it is men who have manifested a hardened contempt of God so that their disease appears incurable. It needs to be clear, Jesus is not telling us to not share the gospel with unbelievers. That would flatly flatly contradict the rest of Jesus' ministry right, and his teaching, and flatly, flatly contradict the mission that he gave the church, right? The Great Commission to go forth and, and make disciples of all nations, right? He's calling us to fulfill that. So Jesus is not saying that we don't share the gospel with unbelievers. But there is evidence that there will be times when people simply will not listen and, and perhaps even be hostile to the message. And in those cases, we're to do what Jesus says to his disciples, he told them that upon entering those towns, he they would find some that were worthy, right? That would listen, be receptive, and, and some would not. And for those unworthy ones, those that would not receive, Jesus says this, If they will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet and leave that house or town. The judgment is going to be harsh for them. Numerous times we see this in Paul, who after preaching to the Jews said to their rejection, You judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. And he went He went forth. He went on his way to preach to others that they may receive. Stott sums it up well when he writes this. Our Christian witness and evangelistic preaching are not to be entirely indiscriminate. Therefore, if people have had plenty of opportunity to hear the truth but do not respond to it, if they stubbornly turn their backs on Christ, if they cast themselves in the role of dogs and pigs, we are not to go on and on with them, for then we cheapen God's gospel by letting them trample it underfoot. Now, I do think there needs to be a, warn of, uh, a word of warning here. This, this should not be done haphazardly. This is not saying share the gospel once with somebody, and if they don't receive it, just go on to somebody else and call them dogs and pigs. This is a very, very serious matter, right, to, to, to stop sharing the gospel with someone 
because of their hostility. God has given us discerning minds and hearts to be able to know when enough is enough, right? We shouldn't do this in many cases. And we shouldn't do this until we're certain uh, that the Spirit Himself is telling us to move on. Again, this is a very serious matter, but we see the difference here, right? We see these the difference in these polar opposites, where we have the brothers on one side, the sisters in Christ, and we have the dogs and the pigs on the other, right? What is our kingdom relationship to both? The one is gonna uh, gonna gonna end with that that that. Uh, that reconciliation and that renewed relationship where, where we're helping one another out and moving forward. And the other is going to lead to moving forward, but in a much different way, where we don't cheapen the gospel. We don't let people trample it underfoot. But we move on. We move on, and we share the gospel with others that they may receive. So in, in light then of the, the brothers and sisters in Christ and the dogs and pigs, uh, that, that proverb remains true. It says, do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Rather, reprove a wise man and he will love you. And we see that played out here in these two different relationships. In both, a fault has occurred. And Jesus has told us there is a kingdom way to deal with both. In terms of your brother, correct him. But do so after correcting yourselves first, but also do so in a spirit of mercy and humility, knowing that at any moment that same brother or sister may be having to do the very same thing for you. And then in terms of the dogs and the pigs, we can preach the kingdom, we can live out the kingdom, we can plead with men and women to enter it. But at the end of the day, some will simply reject the message. Our job is not to then force people into the kingdom. We, we see this try, <laughs> trying to be done all the time, people forcing people into the kingdom. It can't be done. We can't reason people into the kingdom. But rather, we, we are to simply point them the way, to the way, through Christ Jesus. And if they reject, as Paul says, their blood is upon their own heads. We are innocent. Either way, Jesus is revealing to us how the kingdom of God changes our relationships. In, in this case, to our brother uh, and to those who adamantly reject the gospel. Again, those are two polar opposites, but they have one thing in common. The incomparable worth of the kingdom of God. It transforms our relationships, transforms the way we help one another when someone has fallen, when someone has sinned, when someone has a speck in their eye. And it transforms the way in which we see the gospel itself, where we don't let men and women trample it underfoot, but we but we trust in its power and we move on to others. So we rebuke a brother in love because we want to see him and ourselves molded further and further into this kingdom, and we turn from the dogs and pigs in order not to cheapen the kingdom. You know, this morning, uh, if, if you have a judgmental, condemning spirit, and we all do at some point, I would simply ask you to consider consider your own life, consider your sin in relation to God first, in the depths of His grace, and then allow that to direct how you relate to your brother. You know, none of us deserve to be in the kingdom, but God has graciously given us this great pearl. So we're to live by that grace. We're to live in that mercy, right? On the other hand, you know, perhaps this morning you've proclaimed the gospel to someone who's adamantly rejected it. Um, perhaps, possibly, quite possibly, and the Spirit is telling you to, to move on to someone else. Now, Stott is clear. He says this is for exceptional situations only. It says our normal Christian duty is to be patient and persevere with others as God has patiently persevered with, uh, with us. So in, these, in this situation, then ask God for wisdom. But in either case, treasure the kingdom above all. And finally, if you aren't in the kingdom, if you've rejected it in the past, we plead with you, I plead with you today. You know, do not continue to harden your heart. Rather, recognize the patience that God has had with you and the extent to which He has shown His grace in Christ Jesus and turn to Him in repentance and faith. 
and walk in that newness of life brought about by the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, We thank you that in it here in this specific passage, we see, again, just another situation, another case where Christ changes us, where his kingdom, his rule and reign has already been breaking into the world and it's breaking in in our lives as well. Father, help us to to see that the kingdom changes the way in which we relate to others, the way we relate to our brothers, the way we relate to those who adamantly reject the gospel. Father, help us to have wisdom, uh, to to be discerning in how to relate uh, uh, to each of these groups. Father, we thank you again uh, for all that Christ has done for us, the patience that you have for us, and the love that was displayed on the cross. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, thank you for tuning in. I uh, do want to make clear um, that we will be having uh, a video posted as well uh, at 6 o'clock uh, this evening. So just tune tune in back with us at 6 o'clock. I uh, appreciate you watching this morning. And I uh, do hope there's a little bit of snow on the ground at this point. Uh, so go out and, and enjoy it.